so we took our plates, we went in this other room, right across from where the kitchen is. And um, as I was sitting in there, a thought occurred to me. Boy, it's hard for me to tell this. <laughs> um, I sat in that room, in that church, as a young man of 20, not being a Christian. But um, my friend Dave, you heard my story, most of you, my best friend, who was the one most instrumental in leading me to faith in Christ, he invited me to come to church, and I started going to church. I didn't have a clue. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so I started going to church and Sunday school and that kind of stuff, and it was in that room that I sat. We would gather together there for Sunday school, for like youth group type of thing. And uh, this is the place where I began to learn the things of the Lord. And uh, it wasn't too many months after that when God re removed some stuff from my life that was interfering with me coming to the Lord in faith that I gave my life to Christ. Um, and that was, that was over 33 years ago. So just to be in that room, There's the words of a song, and it goes, and baby, won't you look at me now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. Okay. I'm not sure. I just felt like I wanted to say about that. All right. So I should preach now. All right. We're looking at this idea. Uh, last week, we introduced the idea of one cry. This is a nationwide call for spiritual awakening. I gave you a handout last week. This week, uh, the handout is a little bit different. And uh, last week, what we looked at is, um, okay, why? Like, what's this about, this idea of one cry? Why one cry? And what we learned is that um, the fact that there is certainly a desperate need for revival in our culture, in our country. We looked at Hebrews chapter 10, looked at these two different things, this idea of hope for God's people, because this whole One Cry movement is all about hope. It talks about some difficult things as well, but it's really all about hope. The fact that there is hope for God's people. But it also talks about this unpleasant reality about what the Bible talks about quite a bit, but we really don't like to read about it or hear about it. It's the idea of judgment. The judgment of our culture in general, but even the judgment of God's people. And so, uh, one of the things that I handed out last week was this thing called a Declaration of National Spiritual Emergency. And we closed the service last week with this, and I had this read it together. But I just wanted to, before we start in for the scripture reading this morning, I just wanted to read this one more time, and just sort of just draw out a couple of things here. Um, just so you just begin to let this idea sink in. This is critically important for the days that we're living in right now, for us as Christians in God's church to begin to really be drawn into this. So here's the words of this declaration of natural, I keep on saying natural, national spiritual emergency. With heavy hearts, we recognize that the church in America is in a state of spiritual emergency. Like the churches warned in Revelation, and that's what we're going to look at this morning is the book of Revelation. Like the church is warned in Revelation, we have become lukewarm and compromised, and the light of our witness has grown dim. We confess that despite access to more resources and biblical teaching than any other group of believers in history, we are not characterized by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's what's missing from the church today in America, is the supernatural presence and power. Continues, we acknowledge our lack of widespread impact for Christ on our lost and disintegrating culture. But God is waking us from our slumber. And boy, do we need that. And mobilizing us to pray earnestly for revival. This is what the One Cry movement is all about. Together we desire to 
to travel the narrow road of brokenness, humility, and repentance. That's the stuff we don't really like. But that's the stuff that is absolutely necessary right now. So it says, in desperation for God, we cry out for an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit in our day. See, that word desperation is very important. How many people feel desperate? Like right now. When you look at what's going on around us. Anybody? I don't know about you, I'm feeling pretty desperate these days. And there's some people there, you know what, it's like, they're not there yet. They're still distracted with all this stuff of the world. They're too busy with their own stuff to really pay attention, to really care. But God is bringing us, all of us, to a place of desperation. Some people are still kind of clueless, but it's coming. <laughs> Some people have already figured it out. We're in a place of desperation. Other people, it's going to take something more serious to bring them to that place. That's coming. It's coming. In desperation for God, we cry out for an extraordinary work of the Holy Spirit in our day. We believe that true revival is the only hope, and it is. The only hope to reverse our spiritual recession and enable us to once again display the beauty of Jesus Christ in this gospel throughout the world. The last part of the declaration says this then. Because we believe that only Christ can save, heal, and revive, we pledge to, and then there's three things, and this is what we're going to cover as part of our message this morning. We pledge to turn in humble repentance for every sin that God reveals to us, pray, with urgency for spiritual recovery and awakening, and unite with other believers in spreading the hope of Christ-centered revival. And then it just finishes up by saying, Lord, send revival and let it begin in me. So that's our focus, is to uh, look at all those issues, so that we might, with one voice, with one cry, position ourselves to help uh, and cooperate with God in bringing about revival. So this week, uh, the first we're going to cover the first of six revival principles. And uh, I'm not sure. Is my clicker working here? Am I? There it goes. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a look at this right here. We're going to cover, in, in six weeks, we're going to cover six different revival principles. Okay. Today we're going to look at the first one, uh, basically with these words. It's about... Him. It's about Him. When we talk about revival, that's the main idea. That spiritual awakening is the visible invasion of the King, Jesus, in His kingdom. Uh, the idea is also, you can phrase it this way, the ultimate goal of revival is that Christ will be returned to His rightful place as Lord and honored among us as our first love or as our highest priority. The uh, words of Scripture in Revelation chapter 1 and 2 speak to that. We're going to read this morning, beginning in the first verse of Revelation and over into chapter 2 and verse 7. Because I believe these are very pertinent words for the church today, as much as they were written down almost 2,000 years ago by the Apostle John, uh, to give us this revelation. So everybody have the book of Revelation chapter 1? You can follow with me there. Beginning in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed be, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve 
is God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom, and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on the scroll what, scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his, hand, in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of Well, these beginning words of Revelation certainly paint, certainly paint for us a awesome picture of our precious Lord as he begins to reveal himself in this vision to John. I love how in this passage uh, Jesus helps us to really uh, just embrace what it means to follow him. If you go back to verse 5, uh, it says there in the second part of verse 5, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. You know, boy, if we could just, just fully come to a place of fully recognizing just how precious that gift is. This is, this is kind of what makes me, you know, when I go back to this place like I told you about uh, this church, and I just think back about my life before Christ and what Christ has done and by his precious blood. You know, and it just causes me to just think all over again about what a precious gift, this gift of salvation. 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. I mean, Jesus is awesome. And look at verse 7, right? Just picture this in your mind. And picture this awesome Savior that we worship and serve. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. This is not just some forgotten minor prophet who came on the earth and said nice words and died and is forgotten. This is the Lord of lords and King of kings, the Almighty God of the universe. He is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. And Jesus says these words. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Right? Those are the letters of the Greek alphabet. The first letter, the last L, uh, letter. Jesus is saying, it's all about me, right? That's our focus this morning. It's about Him. When we talk about revival and about the need for revival, it's all about Him. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Verse 8 continues, says the Lord God, who is, He is now, who was, from eternity past, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Almighty. That is the Jesus that we serve. Look at those other words that he shared. Skip down to verse 17. Right? These are his words to John and his followers. He says, do not be afraid. Folks, when I look around me at the culture today, I'm afraid. There's a lot of reason for fear. All the more reason why it's so critical in these days that we cling tightly to this Savior, Jesus. Do not be afraid, he says. I am the first and the last. He says it again. I am the living one. He is not a dead Savior. He is not in the grave. The power of the universe, through God the Father, raised him from the dead. He says, I was dead, past tense. And behold, I am alive. Not just then, but forever and ever. And then these last words of verse 18. And he says, And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Thank God that Jesus holds those keys. Death is a horrible enemy. Jesus has conquered death. He holds the keys. Are you thankful that Jesus holds the keys? If you've ever looked at the casket, right, be thankful that Jesus holds the keys, that that is not the final word. Jesus holds the keys of death. He unlocks those, that power of death, to set people free from death and give them the gift of eternal life. You see, Jesus is the glorious, all-powerful, all-powerful Lord of the universe. So when we talk about revival, we're talking about the fact that revival brings about the manifest presence of Christ among us. We begin to see that that manifest presence of God is uh, flowing throughout the earth as revival begins to happen. You see, it's about Him. That's the principle, right? That's the purpose of our very lives. It's all about Christ and about serving Him. So as Jesus in this passage begins to speak to the churches here in Revelation, did you notice he has both praise and criticism? Right? Go back to chapter 2, begin verse 1, and we see the, the good news that Jesus, as he examines this church in Ephesus, now remember, these are his precious ones. This is the church, the believers, those who have been called out of the world to, to love and serve Jesus. And he has some good words for the people in that church. And so he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write these words. And he begins to uh, commend them for the good things that are happening there in that church. Notice he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks along the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. See, this is a church that's faithfully following the Lord. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. We need to do the same thing today, because there's a lot of people out there claiming to speak truth, but their lives are in the pit of hell. 
the same thing. We have to test things today and find out what is true and what is not true. So, uh, you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So the Lord commends them for what they are doing right. But then when you begin verse 4, this is where he begins to say some other things. And we have to remember that the Bible describes this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. And it says that every single one of us, and the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. The great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. That's, you know, like the fire, consuming fire stuff. But the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. And it says we'll all stand before God one day to give account for what's been done in our body, whether good or bad. Okay, so just like these churches are being examined in the book of Revelation, and specifically here in our passage, the church in Ephesus, as we read these words, just think about the fact that each and every one of us are going to stand before the Lord someday. And He's going to say to us as well, there's hopefully going to be some good words. There will be if you're a believer. There are going to be some good words. Jesus is going to tell you what you did right. But does it cause you to just... I don't know what it does to you, I know what it does to me, to think about the fact that Jesus is also going to talk about what I didn't do right. This is what he's doing here in this passage. Right? Look at verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. Boy, when I think about having to stand before the Lord someday, I like the idea of what he might say about what I might have done right. But at some point, the conversation I know has to shift. Because Jesus is going to have to talk about this next thing. Yet I hold this against you. This is where the, what we call in the Bible the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. I hope you have it. Because there's going to come a day when Jesus is going to say these words. Yet I hold this. And the next thing he says, you have forsaken your first love. So when we talk about revival, when we talk about what's needed in our culture, in the church in America, I wonder if maybe Jesus would have something very similar to, to say to us. Right? Look at what verse 7 says. He who has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you think the Spirit has something very similar to say to the church today in America? Do you wonder what he might hold against us? What he might hold against me? Do you agree that the church needs revival? Because maybe we have forsaken our first love. So in these weeks, as we try to zero in on what this One Cry movement is all about, this is why we're going there. This is why we're looking at this. Because I believe this One Cry movement is leading the way to call us to cry out for the revival that we so desperately need. Now there's three major components of this calling, and these are what's on your handout that you have along with your bulletin there this morning. If you pull that out, you can see uh, part of the description, right? It says there's three major components to the One Cry Movement. It talks about turning and humble repentance from every sin that God reveals to us, to pray with urgency for spiritual recovery and awakening, and to unite with other believers in spreading the hope of revival. And so at the bottom, on the paragraph at the bottom, it says, as we be begin to pray for spiritual awakening, it's important to remember that the scope of what we are asking for involves these three things. Looking in to our own lives, that's the turning from sin part. Looking up to God, asking for His manifest presence and power. Okay, so that's the praying with spiritual, with urgency part. And then looking out to those around us, we're uniting to spread the hope uh, of a Christ's 
Center Revival. So that's the unite part. So there's those three components. So let's just look at those, each of those things a little bit more in depth uh, and turn to some scriptures as well. What does this mean, this idea of turning in humble repentance from every sin that God reveals to us? Well, I think we saw part of it there, right, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Right? He says there, remember the height from which you have fallen, repent, and do the things you did at first. Now, who's he talking to here in this passage again? Is he talking to believers or non-believers? He's talking to believers. But something that Jesus is trying to point out to them, where maybe they're not in a place where God wants them to be. So he says, remember, the height from which you have fallen, repent, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, and that's a scary thought, because Jesus has some very serious words for people who are totally unwilling to repent, or think that they have no need of repentance. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Folks, all of us need to examine ourselves, to turn, as it says, in humble repentance from every sin that God may reveal to us. Now in your uh, handout there, you'll notice this is a, uh, I photocopied this for you because this is a tool that you can use to, uh, to implement what I'm trying to say to you here this morning. If you take this, this, uh, this material and you just spend some time with the Lord, you can read through these various um, ideas and themes Pray through them, read the scriptures that are listed there, and just uh, allow God to look in. You look into your life with this humble repentance, uh, asking God to reveal sin in your heart. So let's just look at the second one as an example. Notice the second little bullet point there says, uh, this is part of what it means to look in. So this is an example so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. It says there, I reaffirm that my relationship with you... Um, that my relationship with you is my first priority. Okay, so go again back to Revelation, right, in chapter 2 and verse 4, right? Jesus was saying to the church in Ephesus, Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken your first love. Simple idea being, Lord, as you go to the Lord in prayer, Lord, have I forsaken you as my first love? Just ask the Lord that question. And then just sit quietly and listen to what the Lord might say to you. And if the Lord just reveals to you at that point, yeah, I think maybe I'm not in first place anymore. Then that's a time for repentance. That's a time for you to deal with that issue between you and the Lord. Okay? And uh, you see there's some other scriptures there that are mentioned. Underneath that bullet point by John chapter 14, John chapter 15. Okay, so let's look at John 14 and a couple of scriptures that reinforce this idea. And again, you can look up scriptures like this that are referred to in this uh, handout. And use those scriptures to examine yourself and, in prayer and ask God to reveal to you any sin that he might want you to repent of. Uh, John 14, I'm going to go back to verses, uh, sorry, verse 21. Where Jesus, again, we looked at this so many weeks ago, but he talks about this love relationship that he wants us to be in with him. He says there, verse 21, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Right? So talking about that love relationship. The question is, are we walking in that love relationship that involves obedience to the word of God? Okay? Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Lord, am I walking this way? This is your prayer, right? He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other one said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. See, these are words that you can use to pray before the Lord and examine yourself. Look at chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the prayer is like, Lord, am I remaining in you? Am I dwelling in that personal love relationship with you? Or have I grown apart from you? Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
is the idea of prayer. Again, if you look in your handout to the second item, this is the idea of praying with urgency for spiritual recovery and awakening. Or looking up, right? Prayer is looking up to the Lord. And the, uh, you can see the example there. Uh, if you go to the last example on the bottom of the page, it says, Cause the glory and fame of Jesus Christ to become my greatest passion and pursuit. Please send revival to make Jesus known throughout the earth and to fulfill your promises to exalt your Son. You see, that's the idea of what God is calling us to be in prayer about. Not just, oh Lord, here's my grocery list of stuff that I need. Part of our prayer life should be outside of us. Right? Because remember, it's about Him. So our prayer should simply be for the glory of Christ to be revealed around us, through us, and in our community. I love the, uh, the passage in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, because it really exalts Christ uh, to his rightful place. And this should be the type of scripture that inspires us to pray with a heaven, heavenly mindset, exalting Christ uh, and causing his glory to be uh, evident around uh, on the earth. So I'm going to read that passage, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Just exalting Christ. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for Him. Is it all about Him? Say yes. Okay. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. Do you recognize how many people go around kind of, like just sort of minimizing Jesus, like, oh, Jesus is pretty cool, but He's just one of the ways to God. Just one. Sorry. He's not one of the ways. He is the way. So that in Him, it says, all things uh, might be in supremacy. Where is that part? Okay. So that in everything, He might have the supremacy. See, Jesus will be exalted as the Lord of the universe. Verse 19. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. You see, Jesus will be exalted in heaven. You know those verses in Philippians says, uh, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So that day is coming, but even before we get to that day, each and every one of us as followers of Christ should be in our lives and in our prayer, exalting Christ as the Lord of glory and giving Him supremacy. So there's turning, there's praying, and then there's also this idea of uniting. Okay? Uh, we unite with other believers in spreading the hope of revival. This is a big part of why we walk in relationship with other churches in our area. Right? When we have our gathering tonight, this place is going to be packed out because the body of Christ is coming together to worship and to hear the word of God. Um, this is just an awesome time. This is why this is so important to me. This is a high priority for me to walk in fellowship with the other churches in our area. Because it's not just us. We're not the only Christians in our community, in the body of Christ in our area. There's lots of other Christians in our area. And we need to walk together in loving fellowship with those people. It's, that's what this is about. Uniting with other believers and spreading the hope of revival. If you look at uh, one of the examples down there in that, um, in that section, it says this, Allow me to influence other believers in my circle of relationships to unite in prayer until our homes and churches become houses of prayer. Okay? Our homes, our churches, and our entire region should be a place of prayer. And so that's why we need to unite. If you turn to 1 Timothy... This is a passage that talks about uh, what we pray as we come together to unite in prayer and that the purpose of why we do that. It says there in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that we 
request, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. You see, we come together in prayer as the body of Christ, because that is God's calling. It's clear in Scripture that this is one of the main functions of God's church, is to come together in prayer. But like I said last week, you know what? When I call for prayer meeting, okay, prayer meeting is going to be at such a time and such, such a place. As it stands right now in God's church, I know that's the least attended event that I could ever plan. There's a lot of things we can plan. But if I want to have the least amount of people to come out, I just, let's, let's have a prayer meeting. Something has to change. Or we're never going to see the conditions of our culture change. When we come to the place where we announce prayer meeting, and not just the few of us of church come out, but the entire community, then we're getting somewhere. Then we're getting somewhere. See, God wants us to come together to call out to Him in prayer. Hebrews chapter 10, I looked at last week. We have to help one another and encourage one another. Here's what it says. And so let us consider, notice the plural, let us, that's the church, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Remember I said last week, the day, capital D. <clears throat> That's just not a day on the calendar. It's the day. The day of the Lord's coming. If we want to see that day come, <clears throat> then we unite with God, with others, to pray to God. Okay? So that's what this is all about. This revival principle, number one, it's about Him. Because His spiritual awakening is the visible invasion of the King and His kingdom. I'd like to just go back to Revelation 3 to kind of finish up here this morning. Uh, well, let me start with Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. Notice there it says, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So that's part of what I'm wondering about this morning, right? Are we taking to heart these things that I'm talking about? Blessed are those who hear it. Now you heard some words from me this morning, right? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written from these words that I shared in Revelation, because the time is near. Anybody here believe the time is near? Yes. The time is near. Now turn to Revelation chapter 3. And I want to look at a couple of verses that we read with selective hearing and selective reading. Revelation chapter 3. And I want to start with verse 20 because this is the verse we love. Uh, there's pictures painted of this verse. Right? This is, this is something we really grab a hold of. Let me just read verse 20 and then I have a point I want to make here. Okay. Alright, here, here's what we love. This is the words of Jesus. He says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. How many people can picture this painting? You've seen this painting, right? Jesus standing on the door and knocking. Oh, what a wonderful picture. We love that picture. Oh, isn't Jesus just coming to visit me? Isn't that nice? He wants me to come together with him and eat a meal with him. Oh, boy. That sounds like so much fun. Praise the Lord. I just love Jesus. Right? Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Just put yourself in that place. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is knocking on the door. He wants us to open the door, and he's going to come in and share a meal with us. He's going to share life with us. Now just 
let the warm fuzzies just fill your heart right now, okay? Just put yourself in that picture. Now, I want you to back up one verse. One verse. Here's verse 19. Those whom I love, are you looking at it? Are you paying attention? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those whom I love, now, what do you predict is going to be, the, now don't look, okay, what's going to be the next words that Jesus, come out of Jesus' mouth? Those whom I love, I, accept. What? Accept. Okay, what, what do you think Jesus is going to say? Those whom I love, I, give a big hug. Oh, boy, I, you know, come on in, have a cheeseburger. What's the words? This is what we don't like, folks. I'm not picking on you. I'm, I'm, I'm picking on the body of Christ, right? So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, bear with me. I love you. I told you last week. I love you. Okay, so don't get the wrong impression here. Look at what it says. Let me read it to you. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I don't like that. How about you? How many people like it to spank you? But those are the first three words. Those whom I love. If you're walking in a love relationship with Jesus, these words are for you. See, it's not just all about warm fuzzies. Part of what it means to walk in a love relationship with Jesus means, like what the One Cry Movement is trying to call us to, to turn in humble repentance and asking the Lord, Lord, am I right with you? Are you still my first love? Or is there something not right about my relationship with you? See, Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Thank God that Jesus loves us enough to give us a spanking when we stray away from that love relationship and tell us, you know what? Please come closer to me again. Because if we miss this about life, the life that Jesus calls us to, to walk in love relationship with Him, we've missed the very best thing that life has to offer. That's why He rebukes us and disciplines us, so that we get back to the place of the love relationship the way it's supposed to be. Because remember, John? Apart from me, you can do... Nothing. But if the branches abide in the vine, you'll experience all the wonder of what it means to belong to Jesus. You see, those whom I love, and, I, and re, uh, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent, it says. Right? Be earnest and repent. And then he says these words. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. Okay, so now go back to that picture that gave you the warm fuzzy. Jesus is at the door. And keep in mind the verse that directly precedes it. And the reason Jesus is knocking on the door, he wants to come in and he wants to share fellowship with you. But the first thing he needs to talk about when he comes in the door is something that may be a rebuke and maybe some discipline. And when we've properly positioned ourselves in humble repentance before the Lord, then we can be restored to fellowship. Before he can give us a hug, he has to give us a spanking. Are you willing to open the door to Jesus? He's knocking. If the first thing he's going to do is to rebuke you and discipline you, are you still willing to open the door? Good question, right? Maybe it gives you a different picture than the one that's painted. So I simply invite you this morning to do that. To open the door to Jesus. To let Him do a work of revival in your heart as you follow this simple uh, pattern and tool to turn in humble repentance. To pray for an outpouring of God's Spirit and to unite with other believers in those things. So I'm going to finish this morning. I want to show you a video clip. Okay, and uh, you know how to get us here, right, Scott? Okay, don't start it yet. Stop, 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 stop. Okay, don't start it yet.
Okay? And um, before we go to the video, I just want you to, you know, it's two and a half minutes long. So is anybody sleeping? Okay, wake up now if you're sleeping. Okay? I want you to pay very close attention to this video. Okay? It's going to be two and a half minutes long. What it's going to describe is, um, the year is uh, 1857. 1850, so that's a few years ago. Okay, 1857, and it's going to talk about something that started on September 23rd in 1857. Uh, let me back up to yesterday. Uh, who's the talking about the yard sale? You were talking about the yard sale. Okay. I don't know. If you had fun at the yard sale, I'm happy for you. That's good. Okay. But you know, I thought about that. Thousands of people come to Nest Effect to buy other people's junk. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You know, I look at that and I think to myself, whatever, if that's what makes you happy. But in my heart, there's this something that says to me, what would it take for thousands of people to show up at Nest Effect? What if Sunday morning looked like Saturday morning when you can't even drive through town because people are crawling all over the place. You can't even find a parking space because people are all over the place to do what? Buy your junk? I'm sorry if this comes off a little whatever, okay? But it's like if we can get thousands of people out to buy our junk, my heart longed for the day to see thousands of people come out to church on Sunday morning where you can't find a parking place in Nescape because there's so many people coming to church to prayer meeting that you can't find a parking place. That is what I want to see. Because I can care less about the junk. How about you? I want to see a mighty revival sweep this community so that there's not a parking space on Sunday morning or a parking space when it's prayer night because the Lord pours out His Spirit of revival and thousands and thousands of people come to faith in Christ. Now, I want to ask you something this morning. Do you believe that can happen? Yes. It can happen. That's what this video is about, because it did happen once before. And the video ends, ends with this question. Can it happen again? I believe it can happen again. If we turn and pray and unite, like this one pride movement is calling us to. Okay? So with that in mind, watch this video and let it grip your heart with a vision for what can happen right here. Okay, are we all listening? Say yes. Yes. Okay, humor me. Okay, Scott, go ahead. The United States, 1857. Slavery, rebellion, rumors of war. In three years, Americans would turn on each other and make history. But in 1857, New York City, history, the common textbooks don't mention was already happening. The date was September 23rd. A Christian layman named Jeremiah Lanfear held his first ever businessman's prayer meeting in Lower Manhattan. It was not, by all accounts, a rousing success. He passed out flyers for weeks. Six men attended. Two weeks later, the stock market crashed. Thousands of families lost all they had. And one of the greatest spiritual awakenings the world has ever seen began. Week by week, Jeremiah Lanfear's tiny lunch hour prayer meeting grew larger and larger. By December, his six men had become 10,000 men, and they met not every week, but every day. The New York newspapers took notice, and when word spread to other cities, spontaneous revival broke out across the country. In Cleveland and St. Louis, thousands of people.
pack downtown churches and theaters three times each day just to pray. In Chicago, churches had to have waiting lists for people wanting to teach Sunday school. And all across America, pastors were baptizing 20,000 new believers every week. The revival eventually spread around the world. In England, entire towns were converted. Some towns disbanded their police force because of a lack of crime. And so many people came to Christ, churches had to hold services outside just to accommodate the crowds. The world has seen nothing like it before or since. Global revival. God started it with one man. It changed the course of history. And now, in today's world, people need to know. Can history repeat itself? Can it happen again? What does that do to you? Wow. <laughs> it challenges everything. Do you believe it can happen again? Yes. 20,000 people a week getting saved and baptized? Notice how Jeremiah Lampier is talking with six guys who for a businessman's prayer meeting. Last Friday night we gathered at the Hope Center. There's about six people there. Yep. Hmm. I wonder if maybe God is stirring something. What do you believe? What are you willing to do? Have you reached a place of desperation yet? Are you desperate enough to come to prayer? Because God is calling us to this place. The question is, how desperate does it have to get before it motivates us to do what we know we're supposed to do, but we just have other things to do? Yard sales. What's it going to take? Father, I just ask that you would grip our hearts with a similar vision for our community. Father, we long to see your spirit poured out in a way that it happened once before in 1857. Father, we believe that it's possible in our heads in our hearts we long to see that, but it's difficult, Father, to have enough faith to really believe that that can happen again. It's difficult, Father, to really invest the time and effort and the willingness to allow Jesus to bring us to a place of humble repentance so that this might come again. Father, maybe what it'll take is another great financial crisis before people come to this place of desperation, just like what happened in 1857. Father, I just ask that you would prepare our hearts, that we would be part of the few who begin that work of revival, who pay the price to come together with other believers in prayer, in humble repentance, <coughs> crying out with one voice to see your spirit come and do a mighty work of revival. Father, I pray that that vision become a reality right here in this community, right here in this community. Father, we ask for this. In Jesus' name. Please stand as we close this worship with a song.